Hello everyone, my name is Jerry, and welcome to another episode of the Fuji Guys. Have you just bought your new X-T2? Well, in today's video, I'm gonna walk you through all the different features of your new camera. We're gonna go through the autofocus settings, we're gonna go through the buttons and dials, and we're also gonna go through the menu itself. We're gonna help you customize the camera the way you want it. So one of the improvements with the uh, with the new cameras uh, on the X-T2 and of course the X-Pro2 as well, but uh, on the X-T2 we have a wonderful new sensor and processor. So we have the X-Trans 3 and also the processor 3 engine. And what this allows us to do is to uh, not only have all the fo uh, faster focus settings and things like that, but higher resolution of course with the 24 megapixel sensor, but also the ability to record 4K as well. So. Going into the image quality here, what we would recommend, I mean, you keep it at the full three to two, so that has your full sensor readout. And for the best JPEG quality, you wanna keep it in fine, but you can also go normal, fine and raw, uh, normal and raw as well, or just straight raw as well. And the raw recording, you have a choice of uncompressed or lossless compressed uh, raw as well. So it'll reduce your file size a little bit, um, help uh, you know your workflow a little bit there, the speed of the workflow. And if we keep going down, we're gonna go down to the video settings here. And this is where you will see the movie modes. And here, as you can see now, we have here um, 4K uh, here available to us as well. So 4K at uh, 30 frames per second or full HD up to almost 60 frames per second. Now, um, I'll just leave that at 30 frames per second for now. And with the HDMI or the 4K movie output first, uh, we'll just have a look at here. We have HDMI out and F-Log. So now, yes, you are able to get 4K F-Log, so flat profile uh, to HDMI out. You can also do just straight HDMI out as well as, so with um, 420 compression with the film simulation modes or to the card for the same way as well. And then the record control, HDMI record control, you can have that on or off depending if you're using the HDMI out. Um, and you can also have access to the information display as well. So as you're recording, it will show the info on the HDMI out as well. So another improvement over the X-T1 is the, and this is basically based on feedback from photographers. And basically we've uh, increased the height of our dials this uh, pulls our fingers a little further away from the under dials that are underneath the shutter and aperture dials. Um, add a little more merling uh, and height to it offers us a little better, better grip of, the, uh, the, uh, of those dials. Another feedback that we received was the ability to lock the ISO and the shutter dial. Um, so basically you press to unlock it, it springs out and now you can completely uh, have free access to any position on the dial, and then you can lock it into the position that you want. Same with the shutter speed. So you're able to do the same as far as the shutter speed. You can select your shutter speed and then lock it into place. Other ergonomic uh, improvements, things like the focus lever, but mostly uh, raised buttons, a little bit more tactile uh, feel uh, to the overall feel of the camera itself. So it's made of a magnesium alloy construction, uh, so very well built. Uh, it also provides a weather sealed body, so you can take it with confidence. Um, so just real quickly here, I'm just gonna remove the lens. Um, and here you'll see uh, there's a bit of a rubber gasket here. And this rubber gasket is what allows, and this is the 35F2 WR. Uh, so this allows you to keep your camera nice and sealed. Um, most lenses out now, the, the most current ones that have been coming out uh, and the latest ones like the 100 to 400 um, all have weather sealing. So it goes really well with the X-T2 uh, for uh, that side of things as well. Um, we've improved the grip and the finish on the actual leather as well. Um, so it'll be a little more durable and last a little longer uh, in, that situa in, these, in those situations as well. So one of the big improvements is the customization of the autofocus. So I'm just gonna go into continuous autofocus. So on the front of the camera on the dial here, uh, we have the manual continuous and single. So we've moved it over to continuous. 
Uh, and then I'm just going to go into the menus real quick and then we'll go into the autofocus menus. So with the autofocus, uh, you can choose your area size just like uh, you know, the X-T1 and the single point uh, autofocus, you can also select which point you want. Right now I'm showing you maybe the, or I'm showing you the 91 autofocus points. Um, but for, for this demo here, I'm just gonna show you real quick. I'm gonna go into AF mode. I'm gonna go to zone mode. And what this will allow us to do is get a little bit um, better for action. And in zone mode, when you're doing continuous autofocus, this is where you, in, in the AFC custom settings, this is where you can really determine how the autofocus is going to react based on your, su your subject. So in this particular uh, instance here, this is our multi-purpose settings. This is when you're not sure. You just want to make sure it's quick and that it's going to attract as best as it can. Um, but typically this is like, as the picture depicts, is subjects that are moving towards you where it's going to be easily to be able to predict where the customer is or where the subject is going. Um, so it could be multi-purpose in that sense, but um, there's more settings depending on what you're doing. Like in this one, uh, so this particular setting allows you to ignore obstacles. So if you're following a, a, a subject, uh, you're doing street photography and you're following someone that's interesting and people or poles get between you and the subject, it will ignore those objects and just lock onto your subject and continue to track. Um, section three, this is for accelerating and decelerating. So something coming in and out of a curve, for example, like this go-kart. Um, so something's coming in quick, it kind of comes to an apex and kind of slows down just a little bit and then accelerates very quickly coming out of the apex of the turn in this particular instance. Um, so great for racing and, and uh, fast action coming in away from you very quickly. Uh, four is for when you have objects that suddenly appear. So here we have a skier coming over a ramp, for example. So he's going to suddenly appear in the scene and you want to be able to lock on quickly and just track him right away. Um, so there isn't necessarily much tracking and, and distance or anything like that, um, but there's a lot more of a quick grab, snap, 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 grab as many shots as you can, and then the subject will continue on. This one is for more erratic behavior. So level five here, or section, uh, setting five rather, <laughs> it allows you to uh, really follow the erratic behavior, say of a tennis player or um, uh, soccer, like a soccer ball or a football, moving very quickly uh, through the scene. You wanna be able to track that, that subject as it's moving and have the uh, camera be able to react quickly enough. And so it will then preset for the best scenarios. And as you can see, it all, all based on uh, the tracking sensitivity and the speed tracking sensitivity. Um, so depending on the scenario, it's going to give you different options. You can also customize that depending on your needs. So you may need more tracking and less speed. You may need more speed. So the subject is faster, but tracking sensitivity is, is not, as, um, not as important. So uh, that's where you could knock it down and, and do that. So if you go, for example, where it's ignoring obstacles, the tracking sensitivity is, is higher, but the speed tracking is down. So it's not going to change to uh, the different subjects quickly. It will lock on and stay on that subject before it needs to refocus on a, new, on a closer subject. So just like the X-Pro2, uh, we've added the focus lever to the X-T2. So I'm just gonna press it here. Here we have all 91 uh, focus points and I'm in a zone and that's why it's only showing the 91. I'm gonna go into the menu here so you can see um, all the, um, oops, wrong way, there we go. So you can see all of the, the points. So now I'm in single point and I'm still only showing the 91 points. So now I'm gonna go back in and change this to 325. So now with the um, X-Pro2, you actually get even more. You get uh, approximately 50 more points than you do on the, um, on the X-Pro2. So you're going from 370 or 273 to 325. So a little more than, than 50 odd points, but um, I think we all get the idea. But you can see here all these wonderful focus points that you can select. You can make your focus point bigger or smaller depending on your needs. And then to recenter it, you just press in the, the uh, focus lever itself. Now, the focus lever itself has some options. So if you press and hold the focus lever, it will give you the option to lock it, turn it on, lock it, or turn the focus lever off altogether. So what this allows you to do now is now you're, if you inadvertently 
hit your focus lever, it's not going to move your focus point. It will still work in your menus though. So at least uh, in that situation, it gives you a little flexibility there. So we're going to unlock it. We're going to turn it back on again. So now I have access to all my autofocus points. The other thing that it allows you to do is in playback. So if you're actually doing playback and you want to check focus, for example, in this picture, um, it's at the top of a vase here that I had uh, handy. Um, I can use the wheel to really focus right in and, and zoom right in on uh, at 100% view. And then here, the focus lever allows me then to check for focus. Um, I want to check sharpness, I want to check noise levels, I want to make sure that I got the eyelash if I'm taking a portrait, and, and, uh, or that I got the eye uh, itself, not the eyelash, if I'm uh, working with really shallow depths of field. So that's where this focus lever comes into play uh, in the playback mode. Um, now, uh, if you're in playback mode, if you're in the playback mode here, um, and you hit the control stick itself and you hit it in, it will then bring you right up to the playback menu and this will allow you to quickly switch slots. So the memory card slot. So if I had two memory cards in here, I'd be able to quickly switch to card two, which I don't have right now. So I'm gonna switch back to card one. So there are three different type of autofocus settings, um, or focus settings rather, or autofocus and modes. That's the word I was looking for, autofocus mode. So you have the single point, so that's where you're really precise as to what point you want, how big you want it. Whoop, there we go. Uh, so if you want a, a big point or a small point for more accurate for the small point, uh, more general uh, action, things like that, you want a bigger, broader autofocus system so that you can capture more, use more points to, to capture your subjects. Um, so that's single point in zone. Now you only have access to the 91 points because it's actually grouping a lot of those uh, pixels together. So in this case here, we're showing a three by three grid. Uh, you can make it as big as seven by seven. Um, and this is for sports and action and things like that. So um, ideally you wanna keep it, I keep it three, to th three by three for the most part um, and I try to keep my subject in the center. Sometimes you might want a little bit bigger zone depending on how big the subject is in your viewfinder as well or in your view. And then uh, really large, this is where if you might have multiple subjects in the frame and you want it to pick um, the first, the closest subject or you, or you want it to stay, depending on your focus modes that you chose, if say for example you chose um, the closest subject all the time, so it's going to quickly switch from one subject to another and it'll always maintain on the front target. Uh, this will allow you to track that and it will show you in the scene how that works. So you can kind of see how it's grabbing onto the chair at the end there and it's grabbing onto a focus, but it'll actually lock on. It's actually locking onto a cable that's running uh, in, in our boardroom here. We have a little cable running from one of our um, conference phones and it's actually grabbing onto that. Uh, which is pretty, pretty neat, to be honest. Uh, so you have a little more control there. And then the last one is the wide. Now wide tracking, what this is really good for is if you're doing, um, a, say, street photography and you've got a scene set up and you've got people walking in and out of the scene, if you wanted to have uh, the camera automatically grab that subject as you enters the scene and follow the subject so you know you're focused on that subject the whole time, that's where the wide tracking could come into play. So a slow moving train coming into the scene um, or people, uh, that's where you would use the wide tracking more, more often. So not only have we improved the ergonomics of the uh, X-T2, but we've also improved the ergonomics and the control of the grip itself. So this is the full kit with the grip itself. I've got the 35F2 on there. Um, so just to kind of go over the grip itself a little bit, we've got here, we've added a focus lever to the grip from the X-T1 style grip. Um, so it has the focus lever attached to the grip itself. We have our autofocus and AEL buttons there. We have on the top side, we have our shutter release and our function button and a Q menu button there as well. And our command dials are still present, so we have front and back command dials. Um, this is for the boost in normal mode. So in boost mode, you're gonna get your uh, extended frame rates or your extended video, for, for example, so you get up to 30 minutes of 4K video now. Uh, it'll give you the 100 uh, frames per second in the, um, the viewfinder. Uh, it will give you just overall better performance. Um, as far as autofocus and, and um, 
uh, shot to shot speed as well. So there's some, some advantages in there as well as far as that goes. So you could go normal or boost um, as well. So let me just turn on this camera. There we go. And we flick on to boost. So right away you can see it goes into boost performance mode. Um, so you do need to have two batteries in there to be able to get the boost mode as well. Um, and then on the side here, you have the microphone input, or the headphone jack rather, and the AC adapter power there as well. So you'll be able to power the camera directly just plugging in the AC9VS uh, into the grip itself. Uh, it will charge the batteries. If you happen to have an AC9V from the original, it will work. Um, it's no problem there. And then it will also charge the battery. So right here, it's hard to see here, but there are two LED lights here. And these two LED lights will indicate when the, uh, the batteries are charged. So again, boost mode gives you the, the added performance uh, along with the grip as well. It takes about two hours to charge the batteries in the grip. Um, using the AC adapter, it takes about five hours of doing USB through the grip hand, it's, or the, the handle of the camera or inside the camera through USB and as well through the little block you're looking at about three hours so that's kind of your charging times when it comes to the battery and the uh, using the grip and the different power options now when you buy the sorry the grip and this is something I should have mentioned you actually get that AC9V for free so uh, that AC9VS is included with the grip itself so don't fret if you don't have the power adapter you get one when you buy the grip so what I've got here now is the EFX 500 flash, and this is the uh, shoe mount flash control. So this actually allows you to control um, the EFX 500. Currently I'm just in regular mode, so it's gonna show you TTL. If I use the dial here, I can go full manual and control the flash manual, and the flash will also reflect the same information. I can go into multi, so multi burst, and then choose um, the power of, of flash that I want in the multi-burst. It will limit you at a quarter of a second uh, to make sure that the capacitor can charge up in time to be able to do um, good multi-burst shooting. And of course it will do TTL. Now if I set the flash up at the top here, we've got the remote and the master. Now I don't have any extra flashes connected, but I'm gonna show you how it will look on your menu. So I'm just gonna slide this into the master. And now you can see here, uh, your different flashes. So the first group at the top, this is your master. This is the one that's gonna trigger all the others, so it's set to 1 5 twelfths, but you can certainly change that if you need to. In B, or in, uh, in the, not channel, but in the group B, all my group B flashes are shooting at 132, 132nd uh, <laughs> of, uh, of a sec, or of power. And then you can actually change that as well. So if you need more, you can add more. If you need less, you can add less depending on what your needs are. If we continue and we go into the third mode, into the third uh, group, uh, if I had three flashes, I can now control those as well. Now, as you can see, I can have it set to TTL, whoops, in a percentage as well. So how much percentage on one side versus another? one to one, I can change this to one to two, two to one to four ratio. So you could change your ratios of how much flash you have, um, depending on which channel. The master can also be controlled in that way as well. So you can have TTL per percentages, you can have straight TTL, so let's go straight TTL, and now you can just control each flash. And this actually gives you control over the flash directly from the camera. Also down below is we have a little bit more control like TTL slow sync. Um, for the TTL mode, we can do an auto zoom or we can specifically choose our focal length. Uh, in auto, it will automatically read through the lens, uh, which lens it is and where you're zooming, so it will adjust accordingly. Uh, the master is in group A or group B or group C, depending on how you wanna set yourself up or we can turn the master off. Different channels, if you want to have uh, up to four different channels, you can have uh, three groups and four channels, so you can really um, change your lighting on the fly if you need to. And then your angle, whether it's direct light on, diffused light or otherwise. And then your synchronization. So FP focal plane means your high speed sync, your rear curtain and front curtain syncs as well.
So I've got the booster grip here and I'll just show you come to the, uh, the inputs that are now available for um, the grip and the body. So there's some new inputs compared to uh, the X-T1 and the X-T10, even the Pro 2. So what we've added um, on the side here of the camera, we've got here uh, four ports. We have your 2.5 millimeter remote cable plug, which is down at the bottom here. See if we can get a little bit better angle here for you. And we have just above it is your micro HDMI. That's for your HDMI out. That allows you to record your 4K uncompressed video to an external recorder. It also allows you to do, uh, you know, just uh, if you're doing um, uh, studio work and you're connecting to a TV directly. And there will be tethering available with firmware upgrade coming soon to the, uh, uh, to the X-T2 as well. We have HDMI 3, or sorry, USB 3 here, but it will support USB 2, and this will also allow you to charge the camera uh, or charge a battery in the camera itself. And just above that is our external microphone jack, and that's a 3.5 millimeter plug compared to the 2.5 millimeter plugs that we used to use uh, as well. So it gives a little more um, consistency with what's going on as far as uh, microphone inputs. Um, on the battery grip itself, so Sorry, you do know that there's a dual card memory slot here as well. So that uh, gives us UHS-2 support up to, to U3s. Um, so this will give you the best um, potential for use. So these new memory cards, it will support two of these now, whereas the uh, X-Pro2 only supports the one. And um, so that's the card slot there. And on the grip, so the grip itself has just move this back to make sure we're a little bit better focused here. We have here your AC power and headphone jack. So you're able to now monitor your audio through the headphones uh, using the grip and you also do have an AC power adapter as well. So this will give you with the AC9V, it's the same AC adapter that we've used for the X-T1 and the X-Pro2 um, and this allows you to plug directly in and it will charge the batteries inside the grip. So you can charge in the grip, you can charge in the charging block, and you can charge in the camera using USB. Now, in the grip itself, just real quick, there's the two batteries. So it can hold two batteries, so three total batteries as well. So customization has been key with this camera, with the, with the X-T2, even the X-T1, X-Pro2. Uh, we've added a lot of function buttons. Um, I think I covered those already, but just to show you real quick, we've got eight function buttons for customization. But we don't think that that should be the in, be all and end all. So right now, uh, we can also customize the menu. So you can see here at the bottom in the menu, there's a My menu. So if we go down, we're gonna go under User Settings, Right now it's grayed out because there's no options. So I'm gonna to go to user settings. I'm gonna to go to my menu settings. And now I can add items. So I'm just gonna add a bunch. Um, okay, okay, okay. And one thing you'll notice, okay, so it's filling up. So now I've got all my, see I've got four items in my my menu. So now when I go back, now I'm in regular shooting mode. When I hit the menu button, it's gonna bring up my menu first. Let me just turn off that viewfinder there. There we go. So now we have everything we need. So if I wanted to though, I could do a little more customization and actually order, prioritize where I want them. So if I wanted, say for example, to move the grain effect to the top because I use it a lot, I can then move it up to the top. Same thing with film simulation. I want that one second and then I want my raw. Um, so this gives me now access to the menu the way I want it. Um, and the items that I want. And that way I can really quickly access um, the, the items that I need and, and providing further a tool uh, and an extension of your arm. So very much like the X-T1 and the X-T10, uh, we've added an articulating screen, or not an articulate, tilting screen rather. Um, so it does tilt this way for your uh, waist level shooting or your above, above head shooting. But we have added an axis. So we've got a third axis now that allows you to tilt it to the side. And what this allows you to do now is to hold the camera this way. And with the grip and everything else uh, on the bottom, you'll be able to then use the shutter really to do portrait type, uh, waist level type portrait shooting as well. Gives you a little bit more flexibility on the screen. Still the same high resolution screen uh, with 920,000 dots. 
um, and a, a more a robust screen, a very um, durable screen as well. And of course, weather sealed. It still maintains its weather sealing despite adding that third axis. So one of the uh, feedback, um, or some of the feedback that we had received was about our autofocus uh, button. And being able to detach the focusing from the shutter release itself. So that's what I've actually done here. So as I press the shutter release, it's not actually um, giving me a focus. I have to actually use the back button. So there you go, you can actually see it actually focusing. And of course on a white, flat white surface, it's gonna be a little tougher. So I gave it a little more range there, a little more uh, detection to work with. So there you could see that in using the AFL button, um, I'm able to now uh, lock my focus and then hold my autofocus lock. So if I'm doing some continuous shooting sports, I can then do my sh shooting after. So if I go into say continuous um, shooting and I can use my shutter button, but the shutter button won't refocus. So it's just gonna lock on to the subject that I want and then, and then fire away. Um, so that'll allow you to be a little bit able, uh, better able to predict when the subject is going to be nice and sharp and you can kind of follow the subject as you're um, taking uh, your shots. Um, the other part that it allows you to do now, and because I'm in manual focus now, so this allows me to have a little bit more control on the manual focus as well. So, for example, I can lock onto my, my subject using the AFL button and then I can use the manual focus to retweak. Without letting go of the AFL, it will retweak. Um, sorry, you do have to let go of the AFL to retweak it, but it'll give you your focus point and then you can retweak. If you're doing macro, real close up precision work, uh, it'll give you a little more flexibility in that sense as well. Now, the other part too is if you don't use this button, you can actually assign it um, as a function button as well. So you can actually eliminate that as a focusing button. So in pressing the display back button, I'm just gonna show you here the little map here that we have of all the function buttons. So the one on the top, the one on the front, the four directional pads are actually function buttons as well. And then the AF and the AEL are both function buttons. And there's about 30 different um, options that you can choose uh, to change it. So if you didn't want it to be an auto exposure lock or auto focus lock, you can change that or you can actually eliminate. So if you want to simplify your body, you don't need that many buttons to work, you can just turn off the button and it will do uh, nothing at all. It'll have no function whatsoever. So it'll just be a dead button um, for you in that sense. So as I alluded to before, um, and I think I showed as well, um, the uh, the mapping of all the function buttons. So there's actually technically eight new function buttons. Um, so we have AFL, AEL, which are both function buttons. We have the function button at the top. We have the one on the front. And then we have the four directional pads here. Now, the playback button um, on the left-hand side here is pretty straightforward. It's a playback button. Now. Some photographers might be right-handed centric or would rather not have to use any buttons on the left side because they're gonna cradle the camera in their hands and they would like to have access to everything at, their hand, uh, at the ready on the right side. So you can actually move your playback button. Now it will not disable the playback button. It'll simply allow you to assign it to another place. So if I say, for example, wanted to use the AFL as my playback button because I don't use that button for that purpose, I can go to AFL and then here's playback. And now my AFL is my playback button as well as my playback button is my playback button. But this just gives you a little bit of flexibility being able to um, customize the camera to the way you would like uh, the buttons to be positioned. So I'm just gonna bring that back up again and reposition that as my AFL button again. So AFL, there we go. So the electronic viewfinder uh, is improved over the T1. Uh, so it's providing you the same resolution. So 2.36 million pixels in the viewfinder, same magnification. Um, a 0.77 magnification in the viewfinder. So very big and bright screen, but there are some improvements. So it's two times brighter, which is um, always welcome having a brighter viewfinder, but it's also almost two times faster in the refresh rate. So in boost mode, your electronic viewfinder um, is going to provide you uh, with um, up to 100 frames per second in the viewfinder. 
Uh, and so that will give you really quick action and be able to follow any um, fast action as well. So that's one of the big improvements. Now we still have the eye sensor that uh, automatically detects when the eye is at the, uh, at the ready, but there are some different view modes and different view modes are here on the side and we'll go through those. So in the view mode, uh, so this I believe is just electronic viewfinder only. So it's gonna be kind of tough to see. I'm gonna try to bring it up to the viewfinder to see if we can actually see. Oh, there's a little bit of data. You can kind of see what's going on in there. Um, so that's just electronic viewfinder only. If we hit it again, now we have LCD only, so it will not turn on the viewfinder. And now we have what we call EVF plus, or LCD, or EVF plus the, um, uh, the eye sensor. So what this allows us to do is that both screens are turned off until we move our eye up to the sensor. So it'll help economize a little bit more battery turning off both screens until you actually put your eye up to it as well. And then you have the eye sensor. So we're back to this mode again. Now there's different uh, display settings that you can have on your screen. So this is just a, if you're using viewfinder a lot so you don't want to, you just want to see what settings you have on your camera, you can have that setting. You can have in manual focus a dual screen, just like the X-T1. So that's for manual focus assist. You can also have a clean image so there's nothing on your display. Or you can have a fully featured uh, display as well where it'll have all kinds of information. So if we go into the display settings, so we're gonna go into the screen setup, and then we're gonna go down to the display custom settings. I'm gonna turn all the information you can have on. And as you can see, there's quite a bit here. There's framing guidelines, electronic levels, distance indicators for manual and autofocus, histograms, shooting modes, all kinds of wonderful information that you can inundate your screen or that you can completely eliminate or limit to what you would like to have in your screen. So there's quite a bit here that you can see. And then and there we go. So now, we have everything on our screen. So you have your histogram, so you have a live histogram there. Um, you have your late level, you have your rule of thirds, you have your exposure comp, your drive, and of course your indications all there. And then you can clean that up and have limited information as well if you like, or none, no information at all. Until you hit the shutter release or a focus button to start focusing and then it'll give you a clean um, blank image. Well, if the video helped you today, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Twitter at the Fuji Guys, also on uh, Instagram at Fujifilm underscore North America, and be sure to like our Facebook page as well. And until next time, my name is Jerry of the Fuji Guys. Mm -hmm.